Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Lisa. I really appreciate it. We were just speaking um, b before we kind of went live with everyone. Uh, if the event had been live this year and we had been in Conorock getting ready to journey up to White Top Mountain, uh, today would have been interesting, actually. Um, this, I'm trying to think, my wife and I were talking last night. I think this would have, uh, we were trying to get the total, but I believe my first rally was in 1998 and it actually um, snowed on us that night. And uh, I think this this probably though is is the coldest temperature that I that I can remember, which would have made a salamander hike a little challenge, not impossible, uh, as we'll see. But for a few species, there's no way we would have seen them. So um, in the past several years, we were incredible. Um, so this year, it's if we had to pick a year to be uh, doing this virtual uh, discussion, this is a good year to do it. So I'm going, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you and along the way I will be asking for you to jump in and participate and comment and um, you know if you're able, I'm not sure at least if they're able to actually speak to me, but if not you can chat in with some possible answers. To yes, some things. yes. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't clarify that. And Kevin, can you turn your volume up, your speaker volume up a little bit? I'm at 100%. Am I not coming in good? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I think so. I can hear you pretty. I can hear you a little bit better. Um, Are you sure? Okay. But, but yes, everybody, please feel free to chat. And there's also a question and answer um, block there that you can also ask questions through there. So we, I will try to intercept and help you um, with questions along the way if we need to interject, and we'll go that go that route. Okay. Perfect. Great. All right. So let's go. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Okay, I hope, hopefully everybody can see this, I think. Um, great, so uh, again, it, it's such an honor to be with you. Um, the Mount Rogers Naturalist Rally and the Blue Ridge Discovery Center has a very special place uh, in my heart and I'm extremely passionate about their mission and am ex so excited about the success that Aaron and Lisa and the entire staff, Rachel, they're doing an incredible job and I'm excited for the years to come because in future years, we could be sitting um, and will be sitting in an extremely nice facility um, having the, a presentation maybe just like this. So thank you for the work that the Blue Ridge Discovery Center does. So let's jump into the world of salamanders, right? So the question is, how do you now, how can we do this? And uh, hopefully not make it uh, feel like you're in class, but at the same time, make it feel fun. And maybe you come out of it at the end of the day, feeling like you learned a few things. So if we go back in and say, all right, what was an amphibian? Um, so when we're dealing with salamanders, we're dealing with amphibians. And if we look at kind of the traditional definition of what an amphibian is, right? They, there's some interesting words in there. So if we've got some young people in the audience, let's see if you might be able to figure these out. It says an amphibian is an ectothermic tetrapod. So you're going, oh my goodness, you know, what's that mean? So ecto is talking about the outside thermic. Another way of saying ectothermic is kind of the, other term for that is cold-blooded. These animals are unable to internally regulate their body temperature, but they still do that. That's a mis misconception a lot of folks have. Uh, what, they'll, what they will do is they will put themselves in an environment um, that is the most ideal temperature. So they just move their position to regulate body temperature. They're tetrapods, they have four legs, right, at some point in their life, four limbs, and they have this biphasic life cycle. And uh, that's now, you know, now we kind of consider that, um, I don't know, it's, it's not the best word now. We, we say complex life cycle, and you're going to see why, because there's some of our amphibians that don't really act like we would think a traditional amphibian would, right? So they have this egg that lacks a hard shell, and then the fun thing is they often have this aquatic and then uh, terrestrial stage. So the word actually means, when we look at amphibian, it means both kinds of life. And in elementary school, this is probably what we all thought of, right? The frogs come together, they lay their eggs in a pond, the eggs hatch, they become tadpoles, and then the tadpoles develop limbs and move on to land. Again, we're gonna see uh, for a lot of our interesting salamanders, that's very different. Okay, so here's a chance for you. Anybody wanna take a guess that as of last night, really late, so sometimes professors are just as bad as students. I was working on this pretty late <laughs> last night. Does anybody want to take a guess as of last night, how many amphibians have we been, have been described worldwide? How many species, not individuals, right? That number would be 
incredibly high, but how many different species of amphibians do we have? Break it over to the chat. Uh, I've got a 2548. That's pretty good. Anybody else want to take a shot? 1200. Okay. How about one more? It's a little low to give you a hint. So as of last night, we are at a little over 8,100 species of amphibians. And you're saying, Kevin, as of last night, what are people out discovering new species? And sometimes that's the case. But most of the times what's happening is these are taxonomic revisions where a group of animals that were considered to be one species due to genetics, um, different molecular uh, markers due to geographic issues have been split into two different species. And that's kind of where we are. So we've got about 8,100 species of amphibians. Where are they and what are they? Well, there's three main uh, orders of amphibians that we have. The frogs, which are the anurans, which actually means tailless. So as an adult, they lack a tail. You could see comprise the vast majority of amphibians, over 7,200 species. And then we have the Sicilians, right? And the Sicilians are um, in the order Gymnophiona. These things are legless. There are, many of them are fossorial. They live in the tropics. Most of you, if you saw one and really had not spent some time reviewing them, you might think you were seeing a snake, but they are actually amphibians. There's only about 200 species of those. There's a ton of research that still needs to be done uh, with those animals. And then lastly, what, I'm, what we're interested in today are our caudates our salamanders, the word caudate actually means tailed. So these are our amphibians that have tails as adults. Um, just a little over 740 species, uh, roughly 9% of all amphibians. Because So you can see the salamanders are by no means uh, the center of diversity there in the amphibian world. It's frogs, and with frogs, they're um, centered in the tropics. So unfortunately, right, our amphibians are in trouble. They kind of uh, were the poster child in the 1990s for what was happening, happening with population declines. Um, now we know that's moved on to reptiles. Some of the newest research that's coming out on, on birds, we're seeing huge declines. So this has moved into to many things. But basically, if we look at just salamanders, almost half of all the salamanders we just described, that's over 740 species, are in trouble. Right, and the big chunk of that, there's many, many causes, but the big one for that is habitat loss. Uh, about 89% of all of our salamanders that are in trouble, the main cause is, is habitat loss. But we can see there's other things, and we're gonna talk about some of these today, climate change, chemical contamination, diseases, and then the big thing is most of these act synergistically with each other, so they're acting together to cause problems. In fact, many have said that we're in the, our sixth mass extinction uh, with, that's, that's occurred on the planet with salamanders kind of leading uh, and amphibians leading the way there. Again, many other things have jumped in uh, to take, kind of take that place too, but we're losing animals pretty quickly. All right, but we're here to talk about salamanders today. And um, for those of you that are very familiar with the Mount Rogers area, my background is the same picture I've got for you. This is um, standing at Buzzard's Knob, a Buzzard Rock, looking out into North Carolina. Uh, one of my favorite places in the world, and it's right here on White Top Mountain. So what we're going to focus on today, with the exception of one species, is, are, are going to be animals that we can find um, on White Top Mountain and in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. In fact, the cool thing is once you visit the Blue Ridge Discovery Center um, and their site, some of the new construction, new work that's going on, all of these animals that we're going to talk about today can literally be found within a half mile to three quarters of a mile of that building. So um, pretty neat to have that kind of diversity right here at our, our fingertips in southwestern Virginia. So Sherman Bishop, he wrote one of the first kind of sentinel books on, on salamanders, and he had a quote in there that I absolutely love. And basically, of all the creatures out there, none are more interesting nor neglected uh, than the salamanders. And a couple of facts when we get started that people uh, you know, sometimes are amazed to find out, and, and the data still continues to, to hold true. Sometimes people question this and they'll say, is that really right? So the idea of biomass, does anybody know that's participating today, what, what does the word biomass actually mean? 
may want to take a guess. So bio is life, right? And so what are we talking about when we talk about mass? Everybody's heard of mass before, right? I bet some of our young folks, because I think that's in the Virginia SOLs, probably know about mass. Oh man, we're going to have to get some coffee flowing to everybody this morning. It's, it's quiet out there in the chat. Okay, so mass is talking about basically a real scientific term here, how much stuff, how much matter you have uh, in an area. And we often equate that to be, to be weight. If we took the biomass of all salamanders in the Southern Appalachian Mountains and compared that to birds and mammals, the biomass of salamanders would be greater. And this was work that was originally done in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. And then folks said, well, I don't know. That just doesn't seem right. And a good friend of mine um, passed away recently, Ray Simlich, University of Missouri. He actually even did that work in the Ozarks. And even in the Ozarks outside of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, that held true. Um, there were some places in the Ozarks, there were you know, over 10 kilograms of, uh, of salamanders in a hectare. So it, it's pretty amazing. And if you get a chance to explore the trails around the Blue Ridge Discovery Center around Grindstone Campground on White Top Mountain in the summer on a night right after we've had a really good rainy day. You can go out, walk the trails, and literally have to tiptoe down the trail to not step on a salamander. They are that abundant and that numerous. So um, again, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing feat to see it, and until, um, until folks are actually out there in the field that can experience it, you don't quite understand it. So what's the ecological role of a salamander? Well, they eat things, right? Just like everything else in nature. They eat a lot of things that uh, we don't see because they're very small. Things like these little springtails on the, on the left, uh, isopods, what a lot of us would have called roly-polies or pill bugs. And then everyone's, every homeowner's favorite uh, little critter on the right, which is absolutely one of their favorite foods, period. Salamanders love termites. They're very high in fat for them. So that's, uh, you know, these are the things. During, and then what happens to the salamanders? Well, things like snakes and shrews and owls um, consume salamanders. So they're vital roles. But, you know, sometimes that's hard to sell to people. People will ask me all the time. They'll say, Kevin, okay, I understand these are really cool animals. But why should I care about a salamander? I really, you know, I mean, I understand they have play a vital role. And, yeah, owls are are neat and everything. I'm glad the owls are eating the salamanders and snakes eat them and things, but why do we care? Well, this came to me, um, this picture did last year. It's pretty exciting. Anybody want to take a shot? So we're skipping, uh, going from amphibians really quick to birds. What are we looking at there? Maybe we want to take a guess. You're going to start hearing these, these folks make some noise in the next. That's right. All right. Now we've got some people awake. These are grouse, right? This is a rough grouse. And the rough grouse is a, is a game bird that we find in the Appalachian forest. It has a lot, of, a lot of history. It's a really interesting animal when it comes to this, the sport of, of their hunting with dogs. And anyway, uh, a grouse hunter in West Virginia, one of the last days of grouse season last year in 2019, harvested a grouse. And when they were cleaning the grouse, they, they kind of nicked the crop of the bird, which is part of, their, uh, part of the ways they're breaking down food, and sent this picture. Folks, those are many. We've, we've tried to get an account, and it's hard. But I, I think there's maybe 14. Every time I recount this, I get a different number. But there's about 14 redback salamanders inside that rough grouse. Now, if you remember last year, was, we had a really warm spring. So these animals were really up and moving earlier than they would be. But here's an argument, right? Good salamander habitat is good for many other species. So if you can manage for the salamanders, you manage for other things. And again, if you are a grouse hunter, um, that's a lot of biomass that just went into that bird. A lot of protein that's eventually going to become eggs uh, if this was a female bird and more grouse for, uh, for the population. So they play really cool roles in our ecosystems. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a couple of the families um, of salamanders that we would find on White Top Mountain. And to do this, we've got to start off with the family Plethodonidae. And so when we look at the word, plethora means a lot or full of something, and odon means teeth. And worldwide, this is by far the most um, species-rich family that we have of salamanders. You could see more than half of all salamanders are in this family. And in Virginia, we have 39, getting ready to add one to that, which is kind of a split, but 
the new Blacksburg salamander, where everybody's pretty excited about here, um, that, that would take us up to 40 soon. And this is what you might think of when you think of something being full of teeth. And to be honest, uh, I know when my daughter seen this picture, she's like, Dad, that's scary. That's the arboreal salamander that we only find in, in the Western US. Um, and that's the exception, right? That's not what the word's talking about. This is actually what the word me is meaning. And if you look inside the mouth, so this is a, prepar a prepared uh, skeleton of, of a plethodon, what you see is going right down the middle of them. There's all these kind of recurved teeth. And what they are there for is to actually hold onto the prey. So it's not that the, the teeth, unlike the arboreal salamander here, are sticking through it and looking like a very fierce animal. It's that the teeth are back within the throat to basically hold on to, uh, to prey items. So that's how we get the name uh, Plethodonidae. That's what it means. And I don't know if you can do that, but the little arboreal salamander actually vocalizes, which is also kind of cool. All right, what do we have? We've got a map of the New World, which is the best place to find um, salamanders. And if you notice, as the colors get darker, right, the species richness jumps up, so the number of species that we have. And as you can see, if we start at White Top, the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area, and work our way down to the Smokies, just south of the Smokies, you kind of get this teardrop shape, and that teardrop is the Southern Appalachian Mountains. That is the greatest diversity of salamanders in the entire world. And for those of us listening in Southwest Virginia, it is right here in our backyards. Uh, many of us, uh, myself included, we grew up with this not really appreciating at an early age as to what we had in our backyard. So uh, it's kind of neat. And I will tell you when we look at mountains, individual mountains, one of the best mountains in the world for these animals is uh, White Top Mountain. And it's great because the Blue Ridge Discovery Center is at the base of this mountain. So um, as you can see, uh, I hope that in the future, there's a lot with salamanders with the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. Maurice Brooks, who was a professor at West Virginia University, wrote a great book. All of you that are listening to this today and participating in the Natural Australia, you're doing so because you love natural history. It, it's out of print, and you can often find it at used bookstores and now maybe some online vendors. The book was called The Appalachians, and I encourage you to read it. it it's an incredible book. But in his chapter on salamanders, he refers to this area, specifically Grandfather Mountain, but I would be willing to say that we could say the entire southern Appalachian Mountains are known as herpetological holy ground. So herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. And because that we have had so many species described uh, right here uh, in the Southern Appalachians, this is really a special place to us. So why do we have all these species of salamanders, right? What's going on? Well, if you would pick up your Peterson Field Guide to Reptiles and Amphibians, the 19, which I believe is the third edition, second, don't quote me on that, but the 1991 edition, if you looked up the Mountain Dusky Salamander, this is what the map looked like. So you can see it's right along the U.S.-Canadian border, and it goes all the way down into northern Georgia, right? Well, that's one species, right? As molecular techniques advanced, and with this particular species complex, looking at things called allozymes, basically proteins in the animal, we saw that there were major differences, right? This is what the range map looks like today, right? So we took a species that went all the way from Canada to northern Georgia, and now we see it's been broken up into many different species. And if you notice, the animal is the exact same from the Canadian border all the way to the Clinch Mountains. So if you're standing at the overlook um, just on Iron Mountain and look north across Interstate 81, or if you're at Hungry Mother State Park or any of those areas, your salamander you're finding is the same species that we would find right along the Canadian border. But if we turn our back and now face south, what we see is We've got Orestes, the one in the green in the white top area. We work our way into the North Carolina mountains with Carolinensis, and then in the Smokies, we're in Ocoee. And if you get on Interstate 40 and drive west and go into the Cumberland Mountains in Middle Tennessee, we see there's a new species there. And we've even got something really cool going around, going on around Buffalo Mountain in Johnson City. That's this little gray dot we're seeing in the kind of the sub map. So what was one has become many. How did that happen? Well, let's go back to Dr. Brooks again. He had a great series of books. I think they were like time life books called The Life of Mountains, but he did one. So this graphic is really old, uh, but I, I love his graphic. I think it tells a great picture. When the planet was cooler, um, the, the salamanders ranged throughout the area. They were at a lot of our low elevations. So those of you in Southwest Virginia, in Abingdon, in Bristol, in, in Marion, in Withful, these animals would have been everywhere. Well, as the planet naturally warmed, 
right? The population of these animals had to retreat. Why? Remember, they don't, they can't control their temperature. They're relying upon their environment. So they basically move themselves into positions that have the best temperature. And what, what happened is they basically went up these mountains and they got stuck on the mountain peaks. And we call these areas islands in the sky because literally places like White Top Mountain, places like Mount Rogers, like Rhone Mountain, like Clingman's Dome, like Mount Mitchell, they might as well be mount, uh, islands out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere. The opportunity for a salamander to go from Mount Rogers to White Top Mountain is zero. It's not happening. They don't move very far, they're stuck. And as they were stuck on these high peaks, they began to breed with each other and they speciated. It's a perfect example of allopatric speciation. So they got stuck on the mountaintops. Now, let's dive into some of the species, right? Now, my students laugh um, all the time because whenever we're doing work, I always say, well, this is my favorite. And then I have to correct myself. But today, I think we've got, I've got three favorites um, for sure. And we'll start out with, with one of my favorites. So this is the Weller salamander. Um, it's Plethodon welleri. So, you know, many teeth um, and named after the, the, actually the young person who discovered it. Um, we can find this animal on high elevation peaks in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. Typically, if you're on a south facing slope, you're going to need to be about 4,600 feet in elevation and above. If you're on a north facing slope, you can drop down to about 4,300 feet in elevation. It's temperature difference there. Um, it's a beautiful small salamander, black body with this kind of goldish, uh, bronzy coloration on it. Again, one of my absolute favorites. And one of the reasons why I love it is folks, that's its entire worldwide range. If you're familiar with the USGS topo map, get the topo map for Boone, North Carolina, and it pretty much shows you the entire worldwide range of this animal. Now you say, wait a minute, Kevin, okay, for those of us in Southwest Virginia, it's in Washington, Smith, Grayson counties, that's a long area. It's a little misleading because when we do these, we kind of color in the county to let you know it's been recorded there. It is only located in, in these counties really right where they're coming together on White Top Mountain, Beach Mountain in, in Washington County and, and Mount Rogers in, in Grayson. But it, it's a very, very small area. Known from about now, I think we're up to about 22 mountain peaks between White Top and Grandfather Mountain. On clear days, if you go back to Buzzard Rock, right, my view behind me, you can see the entire range of the sal salamander from that viewpoint. We can see Roan Mountain, we can see Grandfather Mountain, we can look back and, and see Rogers. So to me, it's a classic Southern Appalachian endemic. And more importantly, it's a Blue Ridge Discovery Center endemic because it's right in their backyard. And um, in fact, our research has shown some of the best populations in the world um, in, in their very small range. So we say the world, but their range is actually um, on the North Slope of White Top Mountain. So it's kind of a neat thing. Now let's go back to the picture. So why do I like? I like it so much because my entire career has been spent with young people. Um, I started out running a nature center, working with children as young as three and four years old, and now I work with young adults. And you know, it's probably the most rewarding thing that I do. And, and right now, so many young people feel they really can't contribute. Um, you know, everything has been done, and I love to share this story. If you'll give me just a moment, the, the story on this animal is pretty amazing. In 19, 1917, there was a young herpetologist. Uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, who had already done a tremendous amount of work on salamanders and went to Grandfather Mountain and found this animal and was quite certain he had found a new species of salamander. Uh, he went back to uh, he went back to Cincinnati and started writing letters to folks saying, hey, I found a new species of salamander. To make the story kind of brief, uh, a lot of folks necessarily didn't, um, weren't convinced that a young man maybe had found that. And the next year he led a <clears throat> expedition on Grandfather Mountain to find this animal. And they had hiked in the whole day and they set up camp. You know, it was much different um, in, the, in the early 1900s. You didn't drive up to the top of Grandfather Mountain. And the young man was so enthusiastic as a lot of herpetologists are. He went out and he came back. He said, listen, here's one of these. Everybody was tired. And they went, oh my goodness, you're right. That's a new species of salamander. Well, he went back out that night and the, the rest of the party stayed behind and, and slept. And unfortunately, he, in a, we believe in fog, thought he was on a trail and actually took fell off and, and fell down a ravine. Uh, the party looked for him for a couple of days. And they eventually found him. Unfortunately, he had perished from his fall, but the collecting bag that was still tied to his waist um, was full of Weller salamanders. So the 
unnamed salamander at that time when it was named by Charles Walker at the University of Michigan. Um, they thought it was fitting and proper to name it after the young man who discovered it, Worth Hamilton Weller. And I had a treat over the holiday break. I got a random email out of nowhere out of the UK from his great nephew who had seen some work we had done about Weller, some things we'd written and uh, was wanting copies of those just to kind of keep. So that was, that was kind of fun to, to connect with that, uh, that individual. All right, so number two, um, this is the Yonalasi salamander. Yonalasi um, is a Native American term. It's Cherokee Indian. It actually means the trail of bear. Uh, this is a large salamander. So unlike the little wellers, this is one of our big ones. We, we in the herpetolo herpetological world often joke and call this thing our Cadillac because it's really big and really showy. It's got this nice kind of chestnut stripe down its back. Big, big salamander, seven, eight inches long, maximum length. Really, really neat. Um, here is a young one uh, that was actually found on uh, Bluff Mountain, which is in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. And this shows their worldwide range. So a little farther, they basically go to Interstate 77 um, down just past uh, Grandfather Mountain. So still a tiny range. Here's another great example. We're working on this, right? But in this day and age, this animal has been described for almost 100 years now, and we still know so little about it. No one has ever found a nest of this animal. The salamanders, as we're going to learn, they lay eggs. No one's seen that. Uh, this newly hatched individual probably had, that was taken in July, and it had been um, hatched now for almost a year. So we think they spend that first year pretty much underground, and we think the eggs are also underground. And we have, we have ways we're going to try to Try to find those eggs, we hope soon, but there's still so much we don't know about these animals. All right, our slimy salamanders, everybody, I bet, most of you have seen these. Um, if you've been around, especially in kind of more dry and, and open areas, so often around human uh, habitation, you'll see these. They're black and with these white spots, the white spots will start to fade. And they get that name, uh, they're, this particular uh, uh, binomial name cylindrasis because they're shaped like a cylinder but they get that name because all these salamanders in the genus plethodon when they get nervous they secrete um, substance out of their tail that is very sticky and the thought is that's uh, help from a predator predator tries to eat you you know you get that sticky sensation caught in your throat you don't like it um, you won't do it again these produce copious amounts. I mean, their tail will almost turn white from all the secretions that come off of it, and it will glue your fingers shut, right? You won't be able to pull your fingers apart. It's like super glue. Um, and those of us who work with salamanders, at the end of the day, our hands are normally covered in, in dirt because the glue from the salamander um, gets on your hand, and then the dirt basically gets glued to your hand. So these are kind of fun ones. And this is another one. You know, we're looking at the range of the white spotted in Virginia, but this is another one that went all the way from Canada into Florida. It went west in the Ozarks, and now with molecular evidence, what we see is this map looks much different. Uh, what was one species is now many, many species, right? And in many cases, the only way really to tell them apart is to know exactly where they came from and to, in some cases, have to run molecular uh, evidence as well. All right, our little gray cheek salamander, Plethodon montanus, the salamander of the mountains. Um, this is another one that was broken down. Uh, and the one that we have in Mount Rogers is the gray cheek. Uh, the ones in the Smokies, they have red cheeks. And then others within this complex will have red legs. Ours are, are pretty, pretty basic. Neat animals, right? Um, it is the most abundant salamander on White Top Mountain. Uh, our research showed this. We did some work we'll talk about in a few minutes of uh, some folks that did research in the late 50s. It was their most abundant animal and it was ours as well. So odds are if you're on White Top Mountain and encounter a salamander, I believe uh, about 30% of all salamanders, 35% of all salamanders we encountered on White Top Mountain was this species, the gray cheek salamander. So very, very abundant. And this thing even gets up into the Clinch Mountains uh, as well. So it's not unheard of at some of our high elevation, high knob and places like that, that you can run into um, run into the gray cheek salamander. All right, another one that's really cool, the ravine salamander. Um, these things look like worms with legs, literally. So if you're looking at this animal, you can see it's really long and skinny. In fact, its tail makes up more than half its total length. Many of you listening today in Southwest Virginia, in the last few weeks where we were warm, if you started working in your gardens, 
you uncover this animal. It does very well around people. If you've got a remotely forested backyard, it doesn't have to be a true forest. You leave some leaf litter down over the winter. You know, it's always a great spot if you can devote a little area of your yard to leave to leave the leaves, right? Uh, these things will do well. They love termites. They love other little invertebrates. It's again, it's it's its back looks like it's just been kind of oversprayed with some gold spray paint, really small dots. Um, neat animals. Uh, here's another one. We know very little about um, their reproduction, very little about their um, egg laying and, and where their nest locations are. And they're right here in many of our backyards. Right. My uh, my two former homes, uh, one in Bristol, Tennessee, and one in Bristol, Virginia, we had these in, in our backyard in both cases. Neat, neat animals. Better better view of that coloration, too. All right, the red back. Those folks, if you're listening from Pennsylvania, New York, that area in the Northeast, this is your salamander. Even um, even in places now um, in the Blacksburg area, for instance, uh, some work that we'll, we did with some students in August, uh, you know, we were finding some nights 400 salamanders and 395 were redback salamanders. As you cross Interstate 81 and start making your way north, uh, these animals become more and more dominant. There's less competition. It's always fun when researchers and other folks from the Northeast come to White Top. They're amazed as to how few redbacks we have. And the problem is the competition, right? In New York and Pennsylvania, there's so, other, uh, so few other salamander species. And here, uh, they have a lot of competition. So this animal um, is going to look a little bit like the ravine we just looked at. Its tail is not quite as long. So its tail will be a little less than half its body length or right at it, not, not more. And they often have this red slash orange slash brownish stripe down their back. Sometimes they lack a stripe, which can also be a little challenging at times. These things are really amazing. Uh, there are places uh, in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area in July. If you find a, a you know, you kind of know the habitat and some of that comes with just experience, but you can get on your hands and knees and just gently start looking through the leaf litter. And one year we found seven nests of this animal in the leaf litter in an area of about seven, eight square meters. So um, pretty neat to see the little female guarding her six or seven eggs that she has. Okay, now along the way too, I wanted to show you just some of the research we're doing. So you can see that we are trying to make, you know, answer some of these questions and figure out what's going on. So this is a, a White Top Creek in, um, in, in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. And this is something that we're working with to show what's happened with changes with these animals. So let me give you an example. If we were to pick up this rock, okay, and we look underneath it and we find this salamander, it's a black-bellied salamander, then we can definitively say, hey, at this location, right, we know the salamander is living there, right? Now, the story becomes different, right? So we could check that off in our notes. What happens if we lift up the rock and we don't find the animal, okay? Now we have two options. One, our option on the left, the big X, the animal no longer lives there, right? For whatever reason, the population has been extirpated, they're gone. Or for whatever reason, you couldn't detect the salamander that day. What do you mean by that? Well, these animals only spend about 20% of their time up at the surface. The other 80% of the time, they're below ground. And knowing when the best time to look for them is, right, helps improve your detection. Uh, I will tell you in our work, uh, our detection rate for Weller salamanders is 99.7 some percent, meaning if the animal, animal is there, we're gonna find it 99.7% of the time. Other species, it's below 50%, and that's problematic um, because we, we're we still trying to key in on what environmental factors, what micro habitat factors are important. But I tell you this because we can throw a lot of math at this, a lot of statistics, and it helps us see where the animal really is. I'm gonna show you one graph. We're not gonna bore you with too much um, data today, but I want you to see it. This is um, an occupancy graph that we have for the Weller salamander. And we've got two lines on this graph. One is our modern, the solid line is our modern detection or occupancy, excuse me. And the dotted line is the historic. So, and the organs might be listening today. Um, so if Sylvia and Linda, if you're there, uh, it's always fun to see you in person at these events. But their mom and dad worked um, as researchers in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area, starting in the late 1950s, and really throughout their careers, researching um, the populations of salamanders there. And their father was a professor at um, City College in New York, 
and really was is the definitive person on salamanders uh, in the Southern Appalachians and in the Mount Rogers area. And definitely when it, we're going to talk about courtship, some of the other things he did was just an incredible career for both of, the, of those two individuals. But I, we were fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough that Dr. Organ shared some of his data with us and all of his, his work. And what we were able to do is go back and see where do these animals live today versus where were they living in the 1950s, late 1950s. The thought is with climate change, remember our, our graph we showed you, right? As it gets warmer, these animals are having to move up higher on the mountain. So if our planet's getting warmer, right, maybe they're having to move up. And actually we saw something different. So if you look, the y-axis here is showing you the probability that an animal is actually gonna be there. So the higher the probability, right, the better shot it's gonna be. So when we get up at one, it's 100% probability. So these are elevations, and what we see is with this animal, as we move down the mountain, there's less of a chance we're going to find it. But what you need to look at is the occupancy at these lower elevations, right, are greater now than they were in the past, meaning Weller salamander has moved downslope. And that's a whole different lecture. I don't want to bore you with why that probably is occurring, but that's some of the things we're doing with, with this data, which makes it kind of fun to see that they've moved down. All right. We're still in the family Plethodonte. Let's talk about the Desmogs because these are animals that most of you are familiar with. The other members we've mentioned before, the members in the genus Plethodon, those folks are on dry land, right? They are on the, in the forested area. Most people, when they start out at a young age or even as adults, we often are drawn to creeks. That's where the amphibian should be. At the high elevations that we have, as we've just seen, we have a whole group that is not in the creek. But how do we know we're dealing with the Desmognathus salamander, our stream salamander? If you look, a couple of features, it, their back legs are really thick in comparison to their front legs. Anybody want to take a guess at why that would be in nature? Anybody want to guess what, in nature, what do you think happens when animals have really big, thick back legs in comparison? That's right. So somebody said jumping. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, they're jumpers. So when you're trying to catch these things, one of the frustrating things is they're hard to catch in creeks, right? And then when you finally get one, you're doing this juggling act with it because it keeps jumping out of your hands. The other thing you want to look at is just below its eye, there's going to be a stripe going from the eye back to the beginning of the jaw. Those are the two key characteristics. Now, a lot of folks love birds. I enjoy birds as well. We can equate these to our warblers. In the fish world, we'll equate these to darters, meaning there's a lot of diversity and they are very hard to initially tell apart. Do not get frustrated. There are some individuals even today that I will see and I'm still go, oh boy. It's, some of them are able to hybridize, but it's tough. So we're gonna talk about some of the characteristics to help you, but for the most part, we're gonna be thinking about creeks. So I'll go back to work again that uh, Nelson Harston did and, and Jim Morgan and his wife Della did. Uh, there's some interesting things when we look, this is White Top Creek uh, as we're coming off White Top Mountain. So we're at about, uh, about 3,500 feet here, 3,400 feet. Uh, we're on private property at this point. Great landowners that let us on their property. We see this nice transition of our designated salamanders from those that live right along the edge and in the stream to those that are kind of up in the rocky areas just above the water to those that are at the land's edge to those that never get near the water. And if you're looking at the animals, there's something that's going to help you identify them along the way. Look at the shape of their tail. The animals that are more aquatic have a very keeled tail. We say it's knife edge. It's almost like you were looking down at a knife blade, that kind of image you would see. Why? It's for swimming. It gives them the better ability to swim. As I move on to land more, my tail becomes round. The thought there, it's for balance, right? So these, these actually become really good climbers. So um, that's one thing you want to look at. Look at the tail. Look at what's going on. Another thing that can happen, and if we were in the field today, we could see that it's so much easier than a picture. But our more, more aquatic bees have what we call cornifications on their toes. If you've ever seen a tree frog climb up a wall, these are kind of the similar structure. They're almost like a callus that's on the bottom of their, of their toes, and it allows them to grip onto rocks better and high-flowing water. Right. So some of these streams, when we get, if you've ever been, um, been in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area after a tropical storm or hurricane moves through, um, it's amazing the volume of water these streams are carrying. And, and it's tough for these animals. So this cornification can help them. So our first one, this is our stream 
salamander, or excuse me, shovel-nosed salamander. Um, so Desmond Nathan is actually talking about the ligaments in their jaw. And one thing that's neat, we think everything works like our jaw, right? And you don't ever want to take a, um, a salamander, right, and really try to force its mouth open because the ligaments on a Desmog work different than the ligaments on our in our jaw structure. So, uh, you know, that's something to think about. Sometimes you'll see people trying to trying to do that. Look at the very limited range. I, I would argue that this is the most imperiled salamander in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. Um, it's we only know it in a few locations along Big Branch, and some of that is actually on private land. It's not uh, part of the Forest Service. This is an animal that could benefit greatly from some stream conservation work, and really we need to know more about it. Um, it's it's hard to really identify it. And here's the problem: that animal looks very much like a black bellied salamander that we're going to get to next. The only way to definitively tell them apart is you have to look in their mouths. And again, you want to be careful. You don't want to rip, you know, pull their jaw apart. The nares, their nostrils, open into their mouth. And on the black belly on our left, they're circles. And on the shovel nose on our right, they're little tiny slits. That's hard. I don't recommend you doing that in the field. But I will tell you, if you go back and look, the area of, of stream on Big Branch where we know we have shovel nose. One time we went in and said, okay, uh, let's see how good we are. So we collected several of these and broke them up into two groups. These are shovel nose salamanders and these are black bellies. All of our black bellies we identified correctly. On our shovel nose, half of what we were calling shovel nose were actually black bellies. So a lot of people on things like Sorry, things like iNaturalist, right? Um, it's great, and I'm, I'm so glad you guys are participating, but you will see mistakes made frequently in identification, even people that, that verify it, and they're still verifying the wrong thing. Um, so it's great. Use it, participate. I mean, it's, it's so what Blue Ridge Discovery Center is doing right now is awesome, but just don't... Um, don't always assume on some of these identifications that someone looking at a picture can do it. I hesitate in many cases on these Desmogs. It's tough to just look at a picture because you need to be able to see the animal from multiple angles to really get a, a good definitive ID. So we'll move on. Here's our, oh, we got a question coming in, I think. Um, shovel nose salamanders at Hungry Mother. I don't think they have been rec uh, recorded there. Um, and now that's, I have never seen one there, but that doesn't mean they're not there. There are a lot of black bellies at Hungry Mother State Park. I remember the year, somebody can help me, it was maybe 2016 or 15 that we did the bio blitz and my group, we got a lot of black bellied salamanders. I'm not saying they're not there, but to my knowledge, I don't know of, of an observation. But that's that's something we could look at. And again, the other problem is it's real hard to positively say that they are there. 2016, someone said on the bio voice. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so here's our black belly. So the shovel nose is strictly in the creeks, right? They really don't come out of the creek beds much. And the black belly will hang in the creeks. If the shovel nose aren't there, they move more towards the middle of the stream. If the shovel nose are there, they'll kind of push towards the outside. These are fierce predators. They eat everything in many of our headwater streams, so if you go up to the top of White Top Creek, for instance, at 5,100 feet, 5,200 feet, this is your apex predator. Um, this is your bald eagle. This is your, uh, you know, your mountain lion in our, in our stream habitat. They eat other salamanders. They're, they're pretty amazing. Here's something else that's fun. We, we all understand the concept of natural selection. There's a lot of variability in the back patterns, the dorsal patterns and colors on these just on the north slope of White Top Mountain, just above the Blue Ridge Discovery Center at about 3,900 feet, 4,000 feet. I'm not a geologist, but the rock has a really pink tone to it. You will find a population of black bellies there that have pinks within their back. And that, that is, sure, they have been selected because they blend in better with the rocks. And it's, their camouflage is amazing. For, so some of you that are out there trying to find these, you might look for one and it kind of gets away from you and it is right in front of you and they blend in incredibly well. The name quadramoculatus actually means they have four rows of spots so on each side of their body. They have two rows of white spots going down. And as their name implies, they have a black belly. The shovel nose we just looked at, they typically are gray. Here's one problem though in all of our Desmogs. 
as they get older, especially old males, they all get black, black bellies. They get really dark. So it gets a little harder. But the key with this one is its tail is killed the whole length. It's knife edged. All right, again, just to show you real quick some of the fun stuff we're doing with these animals. So they're apex predators, right? White Top Mountain is extremely wet. This is looking at the north slope of White Top Mountain. It gets about 150 centimeters of precip a year. It gets another 50 centimeters of water that's just condensing from the clouds. So not as true precipitation. And some work that went on in the late 80s um, through the EPA found that a lot of the stuff coming on the mountain was bad. It was very low pH. Uh, it had a lot of pollution that was coming out of the out of basically the Ohio region, Ohio Kentucky border, uh, with a lot of their fossil fuels um, that were being burned. So we thought, wow, you know, those same uh, pollutants that are coming down could also be carrying mercury. That's very common when you're burning um, coal, for instance. So we wanted to compare the mercury levels in our black-bellied salamanders with other places where we know people have looked at amphibians. Just to kind of show you really quick and what's what's interesting is a couple spots in uh, with redback salamanders, which are more terrestrial. And we have a contaminated stream in Virginia where there was an industrial, not soluble, but another industrial location where mercury was discharged into a stream. And there the salamanders averaged about 200 nanograms per gram. On white top, our average was about 130. But if we just looked at the north slope, which is what catches all that pollution out of Ohio, it was almost 200. Right, so almost equivalent to what we're seeing in, at point source pollutions. So if we look at this as far as consumption levels, we don't have a lot to go on, but in the Everglades, this frog, it just put, appeared, this is the pig frog. And there they, they looked at wet, wet weight of mercury. We did ours in dry weight. And then another location, this is the American bullfrog in a place called Cater Lake, Texas. This is a spot where uh, in World War II, the army uh, was doing some testing and, and released a lot of mercury into the ecosystem. We can see kind of the average liver samples there. If we look at the liver samples on White Top Mountain, what we see is our, our average is more than double what it is in some of these very highly polluted areas. By the way, both in the Everglades there and in Cato Lake, Texas, there are fish, or excuse me, in this case, frog consumption advisories. People cannot eat the frogs because the levels of mercury are so high. What that means is the amount of mercury we think that's being distributed, uh, deposited on white top from pollution, based on what we're seeing in these salamanders, uh, if there was a season, you couldn't eat them, right? They, they would, they're too, too toxic. Okay, the seal salamanders. Here's one of our Desmogs. Notice it's going all the way from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up into, into uh, Pennsylvania. This is one uh, we should find throughout southwestern Virginia. It has a keeled tail, but only the last two-thirds. The first third of its tail is still very, very round. So what we're seeing again is this transition, the shovel nose and the black belly during the water. This guy's moving, moving out away from the, the center of the stream some. Their spots on their back look broken. It looks like you were trying to draw a circle on their back and you were hitting bumps and had to lift your pen off, off the back. That's a great way um, to identify them. Again, they prefer to have their feet wet basically, so they're kind of right at the edges of streams. They're also in seepage areas. That's a common, uh, common spot for them. All right, our northern dusky, this animal goes, again, from the Canadian border into Canada all the way into the Carolinas and Tennessee. There it's replaced because this thing has been split into a couple different species as we work our way into the Smokies. It's very, very common. This thing has a triangle-shaped tail. So when you're looking down on it, it's kind of got a point, but it's not a knife-edged. This comes with practice. This is this is really hard to do, but specifically this particular one, we're very very interested in this animal, and uh, I hope to have time uh, to really dive into this more. This comes from White Top Creek, and there's a specific area on White Top Creek where we find uh, these salamanders, and they are bright yellow. Now, in many cases, they are uh, their bellies are yellow, but this one is bright yellow through it. That's not a, a you know it's not me enhancing the color. Um, we think uh, there could be something going on because there's a population at high elevations and then there's no animals and then there's a population at low elevations. Um, with some genetic work, this potentially, uh, who knows, but this might be, might be something different.
All right, so we're almost done with, with our Desmogs, I promise. Hang with us there. So this is our Blue Ridge Dusky Salamander, um, Desmogathus Orestes. This is the one that used to go from Georgia to Canada that's been broken up into, into many species. And uh, this is the one that we have right here in White Top Mountain. If you have parked at Elk Garden and walked down the trail just near the uh, area where they collect maple syrup, that is the type locality for the salamander. What does that mean when you say type locality? That means that's where the specimen was collected um, by Steve Tilley and Jim Morgan to be described as, as a new species. So um, it's kind of neat that it's, it's got its origins right here in, in, uh, on White Top Mountain, but very, very common. This is the second most abundant salamander species on White Top Mountain, only um, second to the gray cheek. All right, so I haven't told you, I've only told you two of my three favorites, right? So this is number three. Um, this is the Northern Pygmy Salamander, Desmognathus organi. You're thinking, wow, wait a minute, I've heard that name you have. The salamander is named after, after Jim Organ, who again spent his, his whole career really studying salamanders on, on White Top Mountain. So for that, it's always been special to me. And they're just cool, cool animals. Very small. Um, as, as the name implies, as adults, they're, they're tiny. Uh, you will see in the map, though, where they, they've been broken up. The southern population is in the Smokies and in western North Carolina. They're, um, they're much smaller than ours, so our pygmies are larger than their pygmies. But how do you identify it? They have this really cool herringbone pattern down their back. We can flip them over, and you can look in between their front limbs. You can actually see the pericardium surrounding the heart. It's metallic. It's silver. You can see it through the skin, so it's kind of neat. You can actually watch their little amphibian heart doing during their job. Um, this animal in certain locations can be very abundant at certain times of the year. Other times of the year, if you go to the same location, you might not find any. So uh, that's kind of a, a tough one. They are totally terrestrial. They, uh, they have the round tail. They will come to seep areas to spend the winters, but their big fear are those black-bellied salamanders. On rainy nights, the black-bellied salamanders leave the creeks and they walk along the edges of the forest. And these things, to get away from them, they escape, they climb up trees. So on a rainy night, you could easily see um, pygmy salamanders six, seven feet up in the trees trying to get rid of, rid of the, uh, or get away from the black bellies because the black bellies would eat them. And again, I could talk all day because this, this animal is, is super fun and, um, but a couple of neat observations. Listen, when you're in the woods, you always want to be, uh, a, aware of your surroundings, right? Because we do, we do live in bear country. They're pretty well harmless, but you don't want to make some mistakes. And on White Top Mountain, I remember seeing a very fresh pile of, of bear scap and thinking, oh man, what, you know, what are we looking at here? And, when you look into it, does anybody see it? We zoom in. There was a pygmy salamander that had walked its way into bear scat. And I sat there and watched it for many minutes. It was actually sitting there eating the insects uh, and invertebrates that were coming to the scat. So it was pretty amazing. You never know what you're going to see in the, in the world. So always keep your eyes open. All right, a couple more. Our northern red salamander. Um, it's, it's thought to mimic uh, another one we're going to look at, which is a newt. Uh, this one is not very abundant on White Top. Uh, you can find it in, in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. You can find it in areas. Often you're going to be lower, uh, lower areas, but beautiful animal. This orangey red coloration, gold color eye, lets you know you're dealing with um, the red salamander. Our spring salamander, right? This is a wonderful word, Gyronophilus porphyriticus. Oh my goodness, right? If you say that 10 times. These are fun. They, um, Gyronophilus means tadpole loving. They have um, a very long larval period, maybe three and a half years up to four years. They have, if you look right in front of their eye, they have these two lines on each, each uh, in front of each eye. Those uh, grooves basically, um, studies have shown they use those almost as gun sites when they're gonna feed and catch their food, which is neat. But salmony and coloration, really, really cool animals and large, very, very large salamanders. All right, the only salamander I'm gonna show you today that we don't find on White Top, but when we're doing this and talking to the public, we always like to, to talk about these and share these. These are the green salamanders. And typically you have to be north of Interstate 81 to find these. And the reason I want you to see is this flat bodied animal. It's great to fit into little rock crevices. We have had a citizen science project going for many years. Wally Smith at the University of, of Virginia at Wise, myself have been working on this animal. Uh, and we just ask those of you, you're attending the rally today because you're interested in these animals. You're out and about, you think you see one of these, take a picture, send it to us. Um, your work has been quite incredible. So uh, before we started this project, there were only about 14 known records in Southwest Virginia. We are now over 120. And if you see the map, 
all of these blue dots are from citizen scientists who reported things and we went to the location that they reported and verified that the species was there. Some of these were crazy on people's decks and people's basements, um, you know, out in the middle of a, of a thunderstorm and you hide under a little rock ledge and there's a salamander there. So, um, Yes, absolutely. Uh, Amy asked, send, send us, uh, we will pass those on to Lori Williams, who is um, the Herp State Western Herpetologist for North Carolina. And uh, yes, we are working, uh, we just finished a multi-state uh, funded project, Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina, on these species. So yeah, always, always send us any of the, any sightings that you have. We'll, we would love to pass them on to the right people. Kevin, can you, um, yeah. is there anywhere you can put in a link of where they can send that information to? They can, they can, um, uh, what, what I might do is, uh, I can maybe just send out a chat here with my email address okay. and, um, uh, before we're over with, and you can, you know, send me those observations, but it's, it's kind of fun what we're learning. This animal, we used to think it lived in rock crevices, uh, and, you know, it wasn't that abundant, wasn't that common. The whole reason for our study was because we were worried about it. And actually we found that they're, they're doing very well, at least in Virginia. Um, and one of the things that we've learned from this is that in addition to these rock crevices, they, um, they also go up into trees. And a good friend of mine, uh, Matt Chatfield from Unity College was helping us a couple years ago. What we found is we found a salamander in this rock crevice in May, which is expected. And then on June the 5th, we found it climbing this tree and we didn't see it. It was gone for the rest of the summer, weekly monitoring. And then on August the 15th, it showed up back in the same rock crevice. So the question is, where was it from June through August? And what we're able to do, you're saying, well, how do you know? We're able to use the patterns on their back to match them up. So you can see that with this particular animal, it, it matches up very easily. Here's it from the rock crevice versus it climbing the tree. <clears throat> and speaking of climbing trees, if you look at these basswoods, I don't know if you can see them, there's one on the left fork and one on the right fork. We are finding these things more and more in trees. We are discovering that they uh, go up in the summers and <clears throat> as long as conditions stay well, they even come down in uh, late fall. One of the things we've started doing is using trail cameras. Now they don't trigger a camera. What we do is we have a camera take a picture once a minute and it takes a lot of hours by students, myself, going through these, these pictures. I want you to look at this tree on the right. So we have two large trees, the large tree on the right. Look near the upper top of it. I'm going to start a little animation. <clears throat> you can see their eyes glow at night. You can watch this green salamander coming down the tree. So I'll go ahead and start it. See those eyes glowing and it's moving down the tree. Let's show it one more time. So we've learned a lot about why they're using trees. So definitely, if you're finding these, send us information. If you're finding them in the trees, send us that. That's really cool. So kind of wrapping up our family of, of our lungless salamanders. So <clears throat> all the salamanders we've spoken about so far, they lack lungs, the plethodonids. They're breathing through their skin. They're exchanging gas through their skin. And that's pretty cool. It also makes them susceptible to really dry conditions. That's why they're up in the mountains. That's why they're in the creeks. They need this. They have a really neat uh, uh, courtship process we'll look at briefly. And then they do something called direct development. But why do you think breathing through your skin, it's got some advantages, it's got some disadvantages, right? The, <clears throat> the advantage is it frees up a lot of room. The other thing is if you're living in the water, it doesn't make you buoyant, you don't float. And that's a good thing for these stream salamanders, they wanna stay on the bottom. Uh, there are some disadvantages we spoke about. If you, your skin gets dry, you, you can't exchange gas and that's a problem. So the question is though, if you've ever looked at a cadaver, a human cadaver, if you've ever looked at any type of animal, maybe you've cleaned a deer, the lungs take up, take up a lot of room in a vertebrate animal. So with these salamanders, if they lose their lungs, what are they doing with that space? Well, the plethodontids have done something really cool. Work at it from uh, Steve DeBain, the University of, of South Florida. He is shooting these things feeding at like 10,000 frames a second. And you don't realize this. So this is a genus, Hydromantes. It's in the family Plethodontidae. Take a look at this video. This is, again, is shot extremely flat, fast and slowed down for you. What they're able to do is they have a system that will actually project their tongue out. So all these animals we've looked at so far, right, they don't eat like you think, like your dog or your cat. They are opening up and shooting a tongue out to grab their food and pull it back in. A little four-toed salamander that we work with a lot at low elevations. Haven't found this in, in white top yet. Probably is not there, but we never know. Look at it. This is a termite's worst fear, right? 
it opens up and here comes the, the tongue, boom, nails the termites and then pulls it back in. Folks, that's some of the fastest vertebrate movements on the planet are the tongues coming out of these animals. And that's all because the structures have evolved in the spaces where the lungs are not. So pretty neat work. So this idea of their courtship, again, I mentioned Jim Morgan's done a ton of work with this. The males have these big glands under their chins that they're able to, to produce chemicals to communicate with the females. The males in many species get these teeth that actually break through their lips during breeding season, and they scratch the females back and then rub their chin on it. And remember, they've got, they're breathing through their skins. So they've got all these blood vessels in their skin to exchange gas. So anything that gets in their skin is, is absorbed by the body very, very quickly. So that helps there. You can see some of the teeth. And um, it's pretty neat. They do this dance where the male walks around and the female follows him. Oh, okay. Bruce asked a great question. Cavities beneath the ground for feeding by the tongue. So there is actually a, um, uh, uh, a plethodontid salamander, Phagnathus, and it's the Red Hill salamander in Alabama. It's in a really, really small area, and they live in burrows, and one of the thoughts is in those areas that they are waiting for food to come by the burrow, and then they, they can hit them. Most of our plethodontids, they're not so much eating in a true burrow, but they're underneath a log waiting on food to come by, and then on rainy nights, moist nights, they come up out of the ground, and they are out hunting invertebrates. Uh, we've even, at times, you can catch a flying insect coming around your headlamp. You can hold it in front of them, and these wild animals will actually take it out of your hand. Uh, so that's what happens when you get bored collecting data at night, right? You start doing being distracted as a good herpetologist. But um, yeah, so they, they're actively hunting. And again, if something walks by them, they're going to do it. But Phagnathus, if you read about the Red Hill salamander, it's one that definitely we think uses those burrows. So the salamanders do this elaborate courtship dance. And the males in front, the, fem uh, the females behind them, and they'll go for an hour sometimes, walking, uh, covering more than three or four or five meters on the forest floor. And the da dance all ends with the male depositing this packet, a uh, spermatophore that the female picks up. So plethodontids are cool. They have internal fertilization, but they don't have a copulatory structure to allow them to do that, which is really neat. And we, we published a paper on uh, plethodontid uh, Yonolasi courtship, the Yonolasi salamander. Here's some quick video from our observations. And you can see, um, you can see the male again in front. He's doing this tail wag, and there's some really neat things about the frequency of its tail movements. So the male's in front, the female's in the back. Um, this, we just published this paper a couple years ago. So again, it shows you that there's so much about these animals we don't know. Uh, this was all filmed in the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area. But uh, what's going to happen, for time's sake, we can speed this up a little bit, is the male starts walking forward, and he's going to de deposit the little spermatophore, and then um, the female is going to pick that up. So really neat work that goes into their courtship. That's a whole area of, of research, uh, really, for people to, uh, to take a look at. Another thing, they're direct developers. Well, here's a little redback salamander guarding her clutch of about six eggs. What do you mean by that? Unlike a traditional amphibian that hatches in his gills, right, when these things hatch, they look just like their parent. Uh, they, are, they are direct developing. So um, there is no direct, so with the genitalia, the male and female cloacal regions can swell um, when they're in breeding season. The big thing though that's going to help you, um, let me go back real quick, to tell them apart is this mental gland structure. So right underneath their chin, the males are going to get that, and this is a yonolasi, it's huge. And other, some of the other species, we're we'll, going we'll show you, they're, they're much smaller, but they have these big, big glands underneath them that they can use to um, that's how they're de delivering the pheromones. So when they're in breeding season, courtship season, the best thing to do is to look underneath the chin of the male, and it's going to help you tell them apart. So let's see. Okay, so they're direct developers. When the egg hatches, they look just like mom and dad. No gills, no larval period. Some of the desmogs do have larvae, but all the members in that genus Plethodon, they look just like their parents. And this is fun video that I took at last year's Naturalist Rally. I thought since we couldn't be out in the forest today, we sh could share this. We happened to discover, I was just going through some leaf litter with participants, um, a uh, organi nest. So these were very young uh, Desmondathus organi pygmy salamanders. And you're going to need to look right at my fingertips, but you can see them. 
you can see how small they are. That egg has just hatched not long ago and it looks just like its parent. So it's a direct developer, right? Uh, doesn't have the traditional larval phase we see with frogs. You can see another one right in front of my finger there, the one on the right's moving around. You see how tiny they are, right? So that, that makes them kind of fun. All right, time to change families because I know you guys are maybe getting maxed out on salamanders. We could go all day and some of you are like, oh no, right? So the family in um, Ambistoma means to cram into the mouth. These are the mole salamanders. Very common throughout the Southeast, throughout the Northeast. When we get to White Top Mountain, uh, we only have, uh, only have one and it's a rarely, rarely been seen. I have not seen it. Uh, I think the last time it was observed was maybe 1989. Uh, we needed to really do some work to try to figure out if, if it's there. But some interesting things about these salamanders is they migrate to pools, to vernal pools, ditches, things like that to lay their eggs. On rainy nights, sometimes in the spring, uh, one species we have will do, do that in the fall. And that creates some conservation concerns for us, right? Because when an animal has to leave like a songbird and migrate somewhere, there's a chance for mortality along the way. And the big thing we worry about these with these animals is they get hit by cars on their way to breed. So some pretty fun work we've done with the Tennessee Valley Authority at a, a low elevation site we have in Northeast Tennessee. We actually, um, two summers ago, constructed a tunnel for them to go underneath the roads so they're not hit by cars. So they hit this concrete wall, they can't climb it, so instead they're directed to go underneath uh, this particular passage. And again, here's some quick video that just shows one of our first females of the breeding season, the spotted salamander going, uh, going underneath our tunnel. So we were, we were quite excited about that. So here's our spotted. Uh, if you see one of these on White Top or at the foot of White Top, take a picture of it. Uh, it's only been found actually very close to where the Mount Rogers, uh, excuse me, Blue Ridge Discovery Center um, uh, operation is right now. It's that they prefer low elevations. Um, they prefer, you know, these vernal pools or bodies of water. They're going to hold water for about uh, 90 to 100 days and then dry up to keep the fish out. So we're not really sure what's going on here, but um, we think a lot of it is we've lost and gained some agriculture. We see different things with them. They'll lay some eggs, and many of you, I bet, have seen these, especially some of you from the northern part of, this, of the area listing right now. Uh, these either clear or cloudy eggs by a different protein that's in there determines if they're going to be clear or cloudy. If they're clear, there's a symbiotic algae. You can see how the egg looks kind of green. That algae is providing oxygen to the developing embryo, and, um, and then um, the algae benefits from the nitrogen from the embryo. So one of the fun things we do though is we stick little pit tags in these animals. That's the same thing you put in dogs and cats so we can scan them to see their unique ID number. We can also follow them around to the ground, but I want to show you this. This was a female we had tagged in 2009. She was an adult, which meant she was probably right at eight or 10 years old. And we found her in uh, last year in February, and that's gonna put her at about 20 years old. And that sounds amazing. Some of these big animals, we think a Yonalasi, uh, some of the slimies can easily hit 25 years old. Um, so really cool they have, uh, have these long lifespans. All right, so we're wrapping up the family Salamandridae, the Salamander family, which are actually old world species. They're mainly found in Europe and Asia. We have some in the, in the new world. And uh, one of the fun things about them is they produce a toxin. Right, this tetrodotoxin, it, um, it works with uh, sodium channels uh, in your heart, and so it can cause cardiac problems. Now, our newt here is, we don't have to worry about it. If we were a little ringneck snake or a garter snake, it would be displeasant. As we move out into the west, though, the rough skin newt causes some pretty major problems to the snakes there and can also cause problems to humans. I always post this. I mean, it's not funny, but we always hear the jokes about, so, you know, something walks into a bar. Well, this actually came from the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. There was a case in Oregon where someone actually was drinking in a bar and someone walked in and challenged them. They dared them to eat a newt, a rough skin newt, for whatever reason, and they did, and went into cardiac arrest later from it. Other, uh, other examples, more recent examples, unfortunately, um, some young high school students that were camping after graduation, and uh, at some point, someone thought it would be cool to try to eat this newt, and when they did, uh, they went into cardiac arrest now. So, ours in the east, we don't have that to worry about, right? Um, <laughs> go all day. Uh, maybe, let's see. I don't know, we could tell if people, we start getting a lot of people going nuts. 
we'll, we might have to slow down. All right, so here's our, our rough scan, or excuse me, our Eastern newt, the red spotted newt. If you remember when I started early on, I said we, we're trying to get away from that word biphasic life cycle, and the newts are a great example as to why we don't do that. So you notice there's two different animals here, right? No, actually, it's the same animal. It's just two different phases of its life. Newts start out in the water. When their eggs hatch, they have gills, just like a, a tadpole, and they stay in the water feeding and growing. When they morph on the land, they morph into what we call this F stage. Their skin is very dry. These animals, along with the embistomatids, we just looked at the spotteds, they have lungs, right? So they don't need that moist skin to exchange gas, right? Uh, yeah, I'm with you, Bruce. Don't, don't eat any newt, right? Yeah, I reckon don't eat any, whether it's the mercury and the black-bellied salamanders, the toxin of the newts, don't eat our salamanders, right? Um, so they, they move on to land and they're in this dry phase and they can actually disperse several kilometers. They, uh, you'll see them out in the middle of the day when it's dry, so they, they do really well. And this is the phase where they're, we think they're the most toxic, right? Because they're out on land, uh, the chance to run into potential predators. Then they have another metamorphosis that occurs and it puts them in their adult phase. And notice the tail difference. And as an adult, this bottom image, their tail has become much, much more keeled. And what's happening here is that animal is gonna go back to the water and lay its eggs. Fun thing about newts, our newts, when they lay their eggs, they only lay one at a time and they actually will take a leaf and wrap it around it to protect it. So uh, it takes a female weeks and weeks to, to lay all of her eggs, uh, but it's, it's a really, really neat uh, strategy there. So uh, most people have seen newts. This is an animal that on white top was seen only twice up to 1990. We now find it on some of our low elevation transects on the south slope. Uh, we find it in high, high numbers. Anybody want to guess? They're pond, pond breeders. What's, what's the difference in the 1950s, 1980s versus now? Why would we have so many more of these? Anybody want to take a shot, those of you that know white top well? There's a certain agricultural practice that came in to the area that actually helped newts greatly. Some of you buy these seasonally. You put lights on them. I'm struggling. <laughs> Somebody's like, help it, please. Yes, yes, right, Christmas tree farmers. And what they did is they often dug ponds to, to have irrigation for their trees. And what we feel is when those ponds came into to play, uh, that that kind of opened the door for, for newts. Just on the other side of the creek from the Blue Ridge Discovery Center is a pond, and you will find newts around the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. And it's, it's because of that, those, we think because of the pond. That's good and bad. Um, these things are carrying a new pathogen. Um, it's called B-sal. It's a different form of the chytrid fungus that really goes after salamanders. And they're getting hit hard. In places like Belgium, they've pretty much lost their newt population. So we're worried that because these things leave the water and can go several kilometers, that they could be carrying the disease with them. Some of our plethodonids are really tough. Um, and then others are, of our more aquatic plethodonids are not as resistant. So we're not sure what's gonna potentially happen there. Um, yeah, they do. Newts love spotted salamander eggs. They love newly hatched wood frogs. Um, you'll often see them just kind of hovering around wood frog egg masses. Uh, Bruce, you've probably seen this too with your vernal pools. It's awesome. You know, the little wood frogs hatch out and the, the newts are just there to gobble them. Uh, marbled salamander larvae do that in ours too. They love to, to pick those off. All right, so our last family, the family Cryptobranchidae. Cryptobranchus means hidden gills. We only have three species in the world. There's Brady Barr holding the uh, Japanese giant salamander. Unfortunately, ours does not get quite that large, but they're pretty big, right? These are our largest salamanders. The Japanese giant can get up to four and a half feet. Uh, pretty amazing. They're, um, they are lungless. They're breathing through their skin as well, and they have these big, big folds. That's why they look kind of uh, so wrinkly because of those folds. They're suction feeders. So what that means is if you've ever had your hands together in a swimming pool and you pull them away really quick, how water gets drawn in, when a hellbender feeds, it's sitting there and it opens its mouth really quick and it actually sucks its prey in. And they are eating um, crayfish. That's a huge chunk of their diet. You know, we do a lot of work to try to educate 
folks fishing in trout streams, they think, ah, oh, they're wearing out their trout, and there's a lot of people, unfortunately, try to kill these things. These, uh, these animals are dropping considerably. Um, Okay, so somebody just asked a, a, a good question. Sorry, these are coming in about newts. So if they're in their uh, kind of adult color and their skin is drying up, is this transitional? So if the adults, once you go into the adult phase, you're gonna be in that adult phase. Um, and what happens, we see this in our own vernal pools is they start to dry up, they will leave that vernal pool and try to go find another vernal pool in that adult phase still. They can't disperse quite as well, but, and you'll also, you'll see them moving on the landscape in their adult phase too, um, sometimes good distances. But the big dispersal phase is when they're in that F form. So we're worried about hellbenders. They are a candidate species to be listed right now as either threatened or endangered. Uh, their numbers are dropping greatly. And most of that, unfortunately, comes back to us. Um, and part of that is it's our behavior towards them and our water quality issues. This is a former student of mine. and uh, We were doing some work. And it, the joy in her face, I absolutely love it. Because uh, when you catch a hellbender and you see a hellbender, there is, you can't describe it, right? They are just incredibly cool creatures uh, to see. They lay their eggs under big flat rocks. And the male actually is the one that guards the eggs. One of the problems is those rocks will silt in and so it, it, they lose their nesting habitat. Well, we know the success of bluebird boxes. When starlings uh, outcompeted bluebirds for cavities, people begin building bluebird boxes and help bring them back. At Virginia Tech, Dr. Bill Hopkins is doing some great work building concrete nesting boxes. They basically mimic being under a flat rock that they're putting in streams in southwestern Virginia, and these are working incredibly well. Um, the salamanders are using them. They're having really good success with them. So if you're ever out in one of our streams, you see this really weird kind of P-shaped um, structure made on concrete. That's a hellbender nesting box, so please you know, don't disturb those. But um, it's, it's pretty neat, and who knows, once uh, COVID is over, maybe uh, we can get Dr. Hopkins to come down one year for the Natural Australia and take folks out to see those, because they are, they're pretty neat to see. So we mentioned their range map. Um, you can see this is the range map. There was a population in the Ozarks, the Ozark Hellbender. It's pretty much gone now. Most of these populations in Kentucky and Middle Tennessee are gone. You're basically left with the Appalachian Mountains, uh, in Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, the Northeast populations have diminished greatly as well. So um, it's sad that with what's going on, there are, you know, there's potential ways to help this species. Uh, I can tell you some, you know, there's there, the success that's happening right now in Southwest Virginia with these nesting boxes is really, really cool. So um, there is hope, but I'll, you know, always be alert. And if you ever hook one with, with a fishing line, you know, there's ways the Department of Game Inland Fisheries actually has these really cool things for hellbenders to help you get the hooks out of their mouth. Um, there's ways to try to help those. So try to be easy with them and definitely encourage people if you ever see someone trying to kill one on the bank, uh, not to do that. They are not demonic creatures. Uh, they're just really wrinkly, kind of old grumpy people. And these things we think can live to be maybe 50 years old, potentially. Well, um, so yeah, this is kind of one of my fun Yonalasi days that, uh, that, that you normally won't find that many in that, that small of an area. But uh, I wish, uh, as I'm sure all of you do, that we could have been live today and on the mountain. Uh, once we, you know, once we put COVID behind us at some point, um, who knows, we, there's a fall rally that, that maybe will occur. And, um, and hopefully with the Blue Ridge Discovery Center, we can even be doing some individual salamander programs and hikes, even away from the Natural Australia at some point. Um, but if not next year, please come out and join us on one of our salamander hikes because um, it's fun to look at these pictures. It's fun to learn about them, but you can't replicate that experience of actually rolling that log and seeing your first dwellers or seeing your first Yonalasi salamander. It's, it's pretty incredible. Thank you for participating. And again, if you've got any questions, feel free to, um, uh, to talk to me. Okay. So someone says, all right, I didn't, I didn't go to, why are the salam, why are the wellers moving down slope? There's a couple of things going on there. Um, and we'll, we'll take a minute or two. Um, one is competition. And what we think has occurred is the little ravine salamander likes similar habitat as wellers. And we did some lab trials with this. Wellers nest in spruce logs. 
They like, they're adapted to low pH environments. There's a couple other frogs, carpenter frog. Some of these other frogs really like low pH environments. And in fact, some of the places we find well are salamanders. The pH is down to like 2.5, 2.6. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that a animal exchanging gas through its skin is living in these low pH environments. White Top Mountain, the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area, got hammered with acid rain through the 70s into the 80s. There are places um, at 5,000 feet on White Top Mountain that the soil pH is still 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. It, it's incredible. In lab trials, when you look at wellers and you look at the ravine, wellers always chooses the more acidic environment and ravines always choose the more basic environment. And what we think has happened as the mountain got hit with a lot of acid rain, the ravines, their similar niche competitor, same size basically, got forced down the mountain because it became too acidic. And wellers, which love the acidic conditions, it opened up the door for them to move down, meaning their only, uh, their only limiting factor is not just temperature. Now, I'll say something else that is often uh, not popular, but it's, it's true. If you look at pictures of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and you look at it in the 20s and 30s when it was timbered. You can look at pictures of White Top Mountain when it was timbered. The place was, you, we feel certain the salamanders we have today were the survivors. There were many other species of plethodon and salamanders that we lost when the forest in the east were cleared. No one can prove that, right? But we feel certain we've got the survivors. When you do massive timber operations, these things will persist. It's, it sometimes takes 20, 40, 60 years for them to recover. But what we think happened is when it, when you cut all the timber in the 20s and 30s, even though it was cooler, letting that much sunlight come in, it was warmer, if that makes sense. So they might not truly be at, in our area in White Top, they might not truly be at their thermal maximum, meaning there's other things preventing them from going down slope other than it being too warm. Now, could they go from Rogers to White Top? No way, that is too warm. But if 4,500 feet is where they're at now, could they potentially be at 44, 43? Maybe. And what's stopping them? In many cases with these salamanders, it's other species where they're competitors, and it could even be microhabitat differences. So sorry, that's, that's like a whole lecture in itself. Uh, microbial diseases that threaten salamanders in this area. So uh, ronavirus is a problem, but we don't see it as much in our plethodonids. Bronavirus typically hammers tadpoles and ham hammers anurin, so frogs. And then the chytrid fungus, which we've really not seen declines from. We've done surveys. Uh, prevalence is really, really, really low. And then everybody's concerned about B. sal. I personally think it's an issue but the number one problem facing salamanders is habitat loss. And we've had a lot of, a lot of folks are worried. And if B-sal gets here, don't get me wrong, it will do some issues. Uh, but, you know, the surge of, uh, of paper products recently with, <laughs> with toilet paper and paper towels, right? That, that probably has done, you know, more damage to some of these salamander populations with, uh, with excessive timber harvesting than, there may be some of the disease, but we're always worried. We do a lot of surveys for pathogens too, and we're worried because these things live in such uh, small areas, we, we don't go very far. Bruce, absolutely. We use a product to sterilize our field gear called Novelson. It's a chlorhexidine, and we do that because it's a little, it's, I mean, we, we spend money on it. It's expensive. Not that bad, maybe 60 bucks, they'll get us through you know, a field season. But it's, it's more expensive than say Clorox. The beauty of chlorhexidine though, is you can spray down your gear. It'll inactivate chytrid, ronavirus, b cell. Uh, but in five, six minutes, it's pretty much inert once it's dried. One of the problems with Clorox uh, and some of the other things is it can still be a little toxic. So, but absolutely, you should always, always, always uh, disinfect your field gear. Um, that is, we know in South America, the majority of the chytrid fungus, the way it moved was on researchers. Researchers were moving it from location to location, so that's a problem. Um, oh, wow, well, can we identify salamanders by their eggs? So the members of the genus Plethodon were pretty good because they're, they're going to be all about the same. The Desmogs, we're going to be able to tell you it's a Desmognathus. Um, the Abistomatids are, are somewhat easier to tell apart with the eggs. So I guess to answer your question, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, it's harder. The good thing is with the plethodonids, the female is almost always going to be there guarding the eggs. So if you find eggs, look around in that immediate area and you're probably going to find the female too, which is helpful. Let's see, any other questions? Oh, that's great. Love the questions coming in.
So, you know, get out and explore. I will tell you, um, check out the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries website. Their new um, Salamanders of Virginia book just came active about three weeks ago, I guess. It's finally out. Um, take a look at it. They did uh, J.D. Clubford, the state herpetologist, Joe Mitchell, who unfortunately just passed away last year. Oh, we got him. There's some pictures. Yeah, yeah. That is that yeah, is exceptional. You know, I thought I would show everybody and let you know that um, these are two sources we use, and we just got our copy of this, so it's great. One of the challenges with salamanders is Lisa's holding up a couple books. The one on her left is exceptionally well done, the Salamanders of um, Southeast by, uh, by Whit Gibbons and Joe Mitchell. One of the problems is that our taxonomy is changing, and um, it, it's, it's rapidly hard to keep. Every time a book comes out, uh, the state herpetologist was talking to me. He was upset because you know the new Blacksburg salamander did not make it in, in the new book. Um, so... It's, uh, it's hard to keep up on the taxonomy, but they're great references, and the, the absolute sentinel book is uh, James, James Petranka's uh, Salamander of North America. That's another great one um, to have. So they're out there. It's hard. It's frustrating. Uh, a little bit of practice with the Desmogs will help you out. Leave a little area of leaves in your yard. Um, everybody loves to get up the leaves, and the best things you can do for salamanders is have an area where they've got leaf litter, that's where their food is. But get out and explore, and you know, again, the great thing is, this the Blue Ridge Discovery Center, literally looking out their back window, they are looking probably, in my opinion, and some of the data shows it, at one of the best places for salamanders in the world. If not the best, the top three in the world is right behind the Blue Ridge Discovery Center. So uh, it's a great opportunity. Come out in future events, explore with us, and um, I appreciate you attending today, and. Uh, I appreciate you supporting the Blue Ridge Discovery Center any way that you can. Um, again, Aaron and his staff, Lisa and Rachel, they've done some absolutely incredible things. And with our support, they're going to keep doing some really awesome things. And, I'm, you know, I get to see some of the plans. The plans are pretty amazing. So help them out the best that you can. And um, My email, which let's see if I can get this out to you, is um, – let me go back and chat this out to folks. Yeah, I'd say that's probably the best spot to type it in. The yeah, chat. let me. I'll put in my email for you. Um, it's just K Hamid, um, K for my first name, the Hamid, H-A-M-E-D, and it's at vt.edu. Please feel free to shoot me an email about, you know, we had to go, we covered a lot, went kind of fast. If you've got questions, shoot me an email. If you have an observation, love to have your data, and uh, especially, you know, green salamanders, or, or if you just find something in your backyard and you're like, I'm not sure what this is, feel free to shoot me an email, and I'll be glad to, uh, to help you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for giving up your morning to learn about salamanders. All right. Thank you, Kevin. We really loved having you. Great. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day with the rally.